Um, I think uh, active abilities have their place, um, but I think the coolest units in the game are actually the units that um, that kind of that differentiate themselves with how they attack and how they move. Welcome back, friends. We had Tim. We got to talk about campaign and the fact that there is a lot of yellow in the concept art for the third mission uh, or the third camp for the th uh, concept art coming out. There we go. Which is um, apparently it's just a race of killer Pikachu's is uh, what's going to happen for the third faction or just very yellow anime cat girl space vacuums. That being said, we have Monk here, Kevin Monk Dong, who is the lead uh, the lead gameplay. And I had the list. I had it in front of me. I put it on my document. Monk, what's your title? What do you do? Who are you? Uh, I am the lead competitor designer, competitive, I don't even know my own title, <laughs> the lead competitive designer for Stormgate, the lovely game that uh, you have been playing so far and you have been just crushing the noobs on ladder with over the past few days. He's proud was, of that. He's really proud of that. <laughs> I mean, I beat, look, yeah. here's the thing. On Saturday, I beat you Thermal and I got him to rage quit. So... Okay. <laughs> I, I beat well, him in the pre-alpha. That's all that matters. Does it matter that I like I played more and knew things they didn't? We're gonna ignore that. Mm. But I, well, no, 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 no. that's a win rate. Like yeah. you, you know that whole classic. You beat someone once and then quit playing the game, so you have a hundred percent win rate against them. That's what you do now. Oh yeah, I'm two and zero oh in theory. I'm two and zero oh versus theory is like top of the top of, of Stormgate. I'm one and zero. Oh, I'm one and zero oh versus Monk. I'm one and zero yeah, versus Monk versus you Thermal. <laughs> I'm one and zero oh versus Arstum. That's all that matters. <laughs> I'm 1-0 and o versus Monk, comma, perhaps the most proud accomplishment and the most difficult accomplishment that I could have. Because, you know, I've heard it being rumored that maybe I am the number one player on the ladder right now. Have you heard that rumor, mm, I, I've heard the rumor that Monk, oh. uh, or that, that Veni, that Veni Weedy Wiki, if we're proper Latin nerds, but Veni Weedy Wiki, um, number one player on the Stormgate ladder who has only ever played games on the Tokyo server, is actually Monk, who lives in California. Because he's that good. You see what yeah. I mean? With all that ping, he still wins. Like, <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Um, I think the, the you know, <laughs> like, actually, do, do we move on to like dev question? No, we just keep going this way. Because my brain was just thinking, we probably, I don't know how long we get to keep Monk because we obviously kept um, Tim for longer. You haven't got anywhere to be in a rush, have you, Monk? No, I'm just hanging out at the office. This is just a normal day at the office. Oh, well, by the way, welcome to the uh, to the oh. Frost Giant office hey. right here. We have um, our Frost Giant Yeti back there. We have, uh, this is Taylor. He's our live ops producer. He's in charge of making sure the game is running at all times, making sure like the servers are running. Uh, who else is here? We have some engineers back here. It might be someone's birthday right here. I hope they're not watching this stream because uh, this is kind of like a surprise thing for him. Um, oh, the sad thing yeah. is that I can't see any monitors from here. No you kind of can, but like not well. Can you just like zoom in, you know, like um, inner left area? You see what I mean? Like there's a very bright screen back there. I was seeing some being scrolled. I think that is actually our <laughs> editor, but it's too hard to see right now. Oh, <sighs> dude, that's what I want to see so badly. I love how, by the way, you have I feel like you've just went around just before you got on the call and the people who are meant to be working behind you is like, We've got a call. You need to uh, lunch break. Off you go. <laughs> no, I, I think actually no one knows I'm on this call right now. This this happens actually quite often. People are just walking around doing their own thing. <laughs> I just saw it there. The folks are just turning around like, whoops. <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Um, so you know, let, let's dive in a little bit about uh, bouncing for competitive, right? Because, you know, first thing on my mind is uh, what's the most broken unit for the third faction? The, uh, the most broken unit is probably the most anime of uh, ninja anime girls. <laughs> what? Has, have I you been playing Red Alert free? Like, that's no, no. all I'm getting from that. The third faction is anime cat girls, KP. Like, this has uh, been makes heavily sense. discussed in the Stormgate subreddit. This has been heavily discussed on Twitch streams. Like, this is... Mm. Although what I do love, before we get into more serious questions, we got a, a media kit for Steam Next Fest a couple, like, a week ago. And... There's a there's a folder that says third faction. Don't look at it. And inside, okay. there's just a text document that says, "Psych made you look." <laughs> I don't know if that was Gerald. I don't know who that was, but <sighs> that made my yeah. oh, I I was on the floor when when I saw that. It was <laughs> like I got got so hard. 
Yeah, I feel like some people on the publishing team might be a little trolly, but uh, you know, we got super serious Kevin right here to to answer all the hard hitting questions. All right, I got a hard hitting question, and I'm sure KP all might right. have as well. By the way, we do have your I don't know if actually I haven't seen the full game, but uh, your games presumably victory in the Yeti Cup off to the left side. So if there's ever anything no, I, you want to you want to point out. Well, I, I know this game I probably act, I actually lost. Uh, the yep. funny thing is, yeah, yeah. Oh wow, yep. Yep. <laughs> He's like, I mean, look, I'll, I'm I'll one zero versus Monk on ladder, so he can't be that good. Yeah, I can't I, be that good. I think you'll feel better if you just skip this game and the next game <laughs> and then go in on the third one. That's so harsh. <laughs> also, spoiler alert. Uh, yeah. <sighs> Anyways, so one thing I really wanted to talk to you about, um, and I'm sure that a lot of people would be interested in talking to you about, is this concept of infest, or more importantly, racial identities. Because, but we're gonna we're gonna start with infest because it is the big topic that's certainly behind the scenes been heavily discussed in the playtest Discord. Uh, this idea of being able to spawn units with other units, effectively, you know, quote unquote, free units, is is something that has been rather contentious in every in every RTS that has had any number of success. So, talk to me about that mechanic and what your thoughts are, how that becomes fair, how that becomes viable, what the reasons behind adding it to the infernals are, kind of those things yeah yeah so i have a whole spiel about infest uh, about like free units so let me start off this is going to be a very long spiel so get prepared for this content. so uh, yeah content so i think throughout the history of starcraft 2 if you are from the starcraft 2 sphere i think and this is a kind of a hot take that is that free units has gotten a bad rep Free units is not necessarily a bad thing in itself. It's just that the three most common, the three instances where three units were a thing were problematic, but they were problematic for their own individual reasons rather than free units being a bad thing overall. Um, I think the three units that it's a problem are um, are the Broodlord, the Swarm Host, and the Infested Terran. And I think each of these individual cases is its own unique individual issue. Um, and for example, the Broodlord, the problem there, it was too effective against ground units. And I think some of the most interesting interactions in any RTS are the interactions between ground units and air units. But because they really shut down ground units so hard, there wasn't that interesting counterplay against the ground units. Um, for the Infested Terran, I think that was actually honestly a case of the, um, it was not necessarily the infested Terran, but the fact that the infester could store four infested Terrans in its max energy pool, and you could essentially get an above 200 supply army with your army. And I think that was the broken part of infested Terrans. And then thirdly, with the swarm host, I think that was its own issue um, because there was very little way to to counter the swarm host. There was very little way to jump onto the swarm host in order to, um, to kind of deny the... Um, the the little uh, i forgot even what they're called locusts from the swarm host itself so i think in each individual case they were problematic for different reasons um and you can take a look at for example when you go to a game like warcraft 3 those games they do have free units they have mo half the heroes have a summon ability i feel like and in warcraft 3 i don't feel like that's unfair at all because it doesn't um it doesn't like encroach into any of the specific problems that starcraft 2 had with its free unit design so that being said, I don't necessarily think that the current iteration of Infest is non-problematic. Um, I think there are certain abilities in the game, like for example, there's a top bar in ability in the game called Nightfall Infestation that applies Infest in an area. And I think that that actually is working really well. Um, it's a circle that you have to dodge. It's uh, basically a 10 second debuff that infects your enemy units. And I think that's, that's actually um, that's pretty healthy in that it's very limited, um, and um, it, ha it has a cool effect. Um, and I think what you're actually referring to, Bill Wolf, is uh, the, content the contention around the Gaunt having Infest. Exactly. Right. Um, and I think, so one argument in favor of Infest is that Infest is really interesting. Um, when you're creeping, when you're d dealing damage to enemy units, um, or when you're killing enemy units, you get a free fiend. The fiend is interesting, um, and the the effect is interesting, and it re really separates itself uh, from uh, a lot of the other units in the game. It's a cool effect that no, no other unit, especially a tier one unit, has. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other side of the argument, I think, is there 
it, it's inherently somewhat of a snowball-y ability, um, and it can be seen uh, being quote unquote problematic in two areas. Uh, the first is we saw a lot of uh, even this phase before we uh, came out with the balance patch that there was a lot of snowball of creeps on the map, and I think uh, the reason that is is because. The Gaunts came out at tier 1, and you're able to get so many fiends out so early, which represented a huge amount of power in the early game. I think, for example, if fiends came out on tier 2, and your opponent already had like upgraded lancers or things like that, um, I think it wouldn't be as much of a problem, because you're already going to have the counter to maybe like extra fiends, but you don't really have that counter in the early game. Um, the second problem where it comes into play is, I think, the Gaunt drops are, are very powerful, and very punishing, especially towards newer players. Um, so that is something that we're, we're looking at as well. Um, so I think I, I don't really have a solution right now for any of these. Um, I have some ideas, but I think it's really balancing the idea of this unit is really fun. This unit um, has, for, especially for players who are beginning with the game, oh, it does something interesting, and balancing that versus the frustration of playing against this unit and um, how much time we would have to kind of put into the game in order to uh, balance all the side of effects of Infest, as well as um, just putting in all these like rules, one-off rules that make Infest not overpowered. Uh, for example, we've already had to change some of our creeps in order to get around this Infest. Uh, I don't know how, like, if that will be a long-term solution or if we're just going to do that for this balance patch. Um, we also gonna we've we've also changed fiends to be immune to invest. So there's gonna there's already like kind of these like two or two x one off things that we had to do in order to make invest work, and uh, we're just gonna be looking to exactly how many of these we're uh, going to have to do in order to make invest feel good and feel fair, um, and we have to weigh that against like is it worth it at the at a certain point. I think one thing I really like in there is this whole idea that you know. As you highlight, there was examples of free units of StarCraft, it didn't go down well, but you're not letting the um, the past essentially dictate what you do here, which I actually really praise. Like, you know, the moment you say free units, like I do a lot of stuff in Age of Empires 4, they literally have a faction that is the entire unique element is they place a building, and this building over time produces units for no cost, right? Yeah. And it's like, that's not even the the, the, the the Ottomans, I call them the Oppermans because they're OP for a different reason. It's not even because of the passive reduction at all. So, like, I think there's yeah, it's that kind of classic example. If you want to look and say, I don't like free units because StarCraft had this issue, there's always a counter argument on the other side. And I think the cool thing about that is it keeps the door open for a lot more unique design decisions to be made. Um, so, you're not just going for the classic, you know, the, the most obvious one is X counts Y unit, count Z unit sort of format. You can get a lot more creative. Um, one thing that, that I have noticed is like you guys have uh, a decent amount of activable skills in the game already. Mm -hmm. Is that something you're looking to like dive deeper into? Because um, I guess the one cool thing is it gives many more opportunities to outplay your opponent. I know the downside that like I know is this special age of empires that a lot of people didn't like is this idea that for the casuals it's more polarizing because there's just so many extra layers to the cake. Yeah, I think how we look to balance that is. Um, I think you're absolutely correct that the a lot of active abilities, especially if they aren't auto-castable, are not approachable for new players. Uh, there's this really cool stat that I have from StarCraft where in the StarCraft II camp, uh, Legacy of the Void campaign, you were able to choose... Uh, different versions of units, right? So there was there was a Void Ray, which was an A-move unit, and then you got to choose, like, I forgot what the alternative was, but it was like a, it was like a Void Ray that, that had an active ability. And overwhelmingly, it was like 98% of people chose the A-move a unit in the campaign. Um, and that's just, that's just hilarious to me. Um, I think uh, active abilities have their place, um, but I think the coolest units in the game are actually the units that... Um, that kind of that differentiate themselves with how they attack and how they move um, so that in the hands of an average player you can a move them and you can get a lot of benefit from them but if you micro them very efficiently you can get a lot of skill out of them too and and i think uh, my favorite unit in stormgate that follows that is the lancer um, in that i think a lot of people just a move them but we have been seeing a lot of cool micro for, uh, from people who know exactly how to use them for example diving on enemy got lines or um, like holding position in an enemy worker line or like splitting them up for example um, and i think ideally we want to move 
move towards that philosophy um, of, again, the best abilities or the best units are the ones that um, have a certain amount of effectiveness when a moving um, but you can g get a little bit out of them by either using an active ability or microing it in a very specific way um, and when i think of the balance between um, and, and i think that there was a change we made to the brute fairly recently uh, that kind of highlights this uh, the brute is a unit it's a tier one unit on the infernals that um that when you hit a button in the past, you, it spawns into two fiends, right? And if you don't hit the button, it spawns zero fiends, it just dies. But we made a change in the last patch that uh, basically says if you if you hit the button, it spawns two fiends, and if you don't hit the button, it also spawns two fiends. So uh, how I think of it there is, uh, in the past, we it was basically the difference between splitting the fiends and not splitting the fiends is basically a 100% difference. Um, either you get it or you don't. It's very binary. Now it's almost a 0% difference. And I think the ideal with um, all our units is somewhere between a maybe like a, around a 20% difference between if you just aim move the unit versus if you put extra effort into the unit. So that's why I think like our current iteration of how brutes and fiends work is not necessarily ideal. Um, but I think we're we're going in the somewhat right direction. And I, I heard an example on Reddit um, uh, or a suggestion on Reddit that said, hey, what if you give the, the fiends the extra white health or shields if you hit the button, but you don't give it if you don't hit the button? And that's exactly like probably a 25% benefit if they hit the button versus not hitting the button. And I think that's like ideal. That's like a really good solution, a really good idea for where we want to head. And not just with the brute slash fiend mechanic, but throughout um, all our unit designs. Gotcha. And uh, talking about unit designs a little bit, and I'm, I'm, I want to ask you about, I'm not going to ask about the third faction, but we have, so as far as I can tell, the kind of the, the overriding idea uh, for Infernals is sacrifice. I'm sacrificing myself, I'm sacrificing others, and I'm getting some value out of that. That's how Animus works, that's how Infest kind of works, that's how Brute works, whatever. Um, but I was wondering if you could talk about kind of these overriding design ideas for the Vanguard and the, and the Infernals and how that's driving the units you're designing and the, the mechanics you're developing. Yeah, I think before we uh, started designing any units or any mechanics, we kind of uh, take a take a look from the lore side and think about what is like the basics of this faction, like what are they all about? And I think for the Vanguard, it was the idea of um, number one, the that that each human life matters. Like every life uh, d d does uh, have a significance to it, and also the idea of it's like a scrappy human race. Like, you know, they're, they're ne not necessarily have the power, the overwhelming power of, of this infernal faction that it comes from like this, this d demon magical portal that we still don't know too much about yet. Um, but you know, they're, they're humans, they're scrappy. They've, they've dealt with like a, they've dealt with this, um, uh, this apocalypse before, so they know how to get out of troubles. So we have, on the Vanguard faction, according, we have a lot of healing mechanics. We have a lot of shielding mechanics. Um, healing, there, the med tech has a lot of heals. There's the... Uh, the workers can repair, workers come together to build structures, um, and they can salvage these structures. So they're very uh, versatile overall, and they are very shieldy overall, and very uh, preserving of life. Um, in addition, we have the habitats that now upgrade into two different habitats, and we have the uh, we have the sentry post that when you put any infantry in, it actually transforms to something different. So those are kind of the the general mechanics that we have uh, going on with the vanguard because of those um, because of of the the initial lore perspective, and then conversely on the infernals, they are all about like you know the ends justifying the means. And that's why they have a lot of suicide units. They have a lot of sacrificing units. And in the future, I think we're we're still definitely at a relatively early stage. Not all the units are there. Not all the mechanics are there. You're going to see a lot of changes um, as we uh, build up from release to release. But I think you're going to see a lot more of these themes of sacrifice, um, of these like token units, such as fiends, of, um, of just death overall being reflected in the... Um, in the infernal faction and who knows for the next faction what we'll have yeah i know i i really enjoy this you know the ability to like actually go eat a fiend to get health back for example and i don't kp i, I got you I, I i hear you i'll let you get there in a oh. second but you talk about new mechanics monk and i don't know if you can answer this but is there a mechanic that is not implemented yet that you are really excited to, to add to the game 
Yeah, it's a really great question. I think um, there's two things I'm particularly excited about. Um, the first one we, we already kind of have a glimpse of, of which is uh, top bar abilities uh, that are both on the Vanguard and Infernal factions. We kind of have a first glimpse of them in this particular um, in this particular release with um, three abilities from Vanguard and six abilities from uh, four Infernals. I think we're going to really refine them over time, and we're going to have a lot more interactivity uh, with these top bar mechanics. For example, you'll be able to upgrade them. You'll be able to upgrade the energy. Um, you'll be able to regen. Uh, more energy in some ways and then the the thing that i am actually most particularly excited about that hasn't been implemented yet is a creep camp rework um right now the the way we have creep camps and the way we've kind of built the game is um we we are building the game with all um, all possible game modes in mind, which is actually a lot of extra work, uh, especially to if you if you incorporate the the fact that we want to eventually have um, a user generated content editor um, that adds a layer of complexity to things. So what we've been doing so far is we've been kind of just implementing the basics, you know, resource harvesting, attacking, um, basic abilities. But what I'm especially excited about is this creep camp re rework that will fundamentally change how creep camps will work in the game. Right now, they uh, essentially give you some resources. Um, they will give you um, they will give you some kind of benefit which retains on the battlefield, like um, a health fountain, for instance, or um, like a essentially a Zelnaga watchtower. Um, but in the future, we're gonna uh, kind of essentially rework them entirely so that map control is more important um, and so that the creeps will feel like they matter more in the game. Hmm. That's interesting. I, I guess that's maybe um, in response to the idea of like the classic macro approach, right? Whereas obviously, I, I guess you wanna lean more into the Warcraft 3 had naturally where it was always that play out, prioritizing that. I guess one thing I'm thinking in relation to that is there uh, is there any one in the office looking at maybe eventually taking what you have in the co-op and then trying to create a competitive format for that, right? Where you'd actually have your hero characters? Yeah, that was actually a very uh, highly requested feature, um, even back on the StarCraft days. Um, and what we're essentially going to do with that is we're going to take the uh, the co-op heroes and basically transport them into um, our, our marquee 3v3 mode, uh, which is not available yet. Um, but in the future, you will be able to play as the, the co-op heroes in um, a 3v3 mode that is really focused on team play number one of course and number two it's going to be a very different experience from uh, 1v1 uh, we think that i think uh, team rts games have been kind of done poor uh, not poorly but they haven't been really focused on in the past in the sense that they're essentially copies of the 1v1 mode and you have three players so what we want to do is we want to um want we want to essentially design a team mode that is specifically works for team games. And we want to uh, change the mechanics so that it's not just a copy and paste from our 1v1 mode. Can I just quickly say, hell yes. Oh my god. For like years, whenever I play RTSs, like I mean, like, like I said, I do a lot in AOE4, right? And they, they keep trying by, because there's always the folks on 1v1. I know there's like this glory day thing uh, associated with, you know, especially the esports, the pinnacle of 1v1 purity. But it's like when me and Bjorn Wolf were playing some games earlier, like we were talking a little bit about it, like this whole idea is like people like someone to blame, people like someone to play with. They like that kind of community feeling. There's something more impressive when free people are over um, overcome the uh, are able to overcome the differences rather to beat the opponents versus playing perfect on their own. So that is so refreshing to hear that that is at the forefront of the mind and it's not just this copy and paste template as often we see. Yeah, and I think uh, I'm also curious about this as well because we talked about 3v3, maybe having the, the co-op heroes in or, or, or something like that. Um, as you And the fact that it's going to be balanced, it's not just, we're going to play Carrier Rush because that is the most broken unit in, in multiplayer and I hope the frames survive. Like, there are actually opportunities for that one, which is, which is tremendously, tremendously exciting. Um, but I guess the, the question then, as we go into that, uh, you talked about, at one point a long time ago, you talked about exploring different win conditions uh, in 1v1 and 3v3, where 1v1 is annihilation, you just got to kill everything or, or or destroy every building or get to the point where you understand you can't kill every building or continue to fight, then you tap out. Uh, has there been any further development into these alternative win conditions that you talked about in 3v3, I think maybe a year and a half ago, and where the team is is looking about from that on that front? Uh, yeah, so 
We've done a bit of prototyping around the 3v3. It's not currently a priority, but um, where we're leading towards right now is we want there to be kind of a singular objective that you have to uh, that you have to do in order to win the game, essentially. Um, and there are a lot of there are a lot of uh, mini objectives on the map that will help you advance your main objective. But at the end of the day, it's it's going to be um, a very clear cut objective that. Uh, is very is relatively is less open ended and a little more binary. I'm trying to I'm trying to talk about it without actually talking about it. If you get my jest, um, but yeah, we don't like the idea that like and I'm sure you know this, Bill Wolf, having having been the forefront of Stormgate development uh, with your website. Um, <laughs> but uh, we don't uh, in in team games. And RTS team games is really the only genre of team games where you are incentivized to eliminate opponents. If you think of MOBAs, if you think of FPS, you always revive. You, you die, but you always revive later on and you're able to come back into the game. Whereas in RTS, it's legitimately a good strategy to eliminate a single player from the map and then they just can't play anymore. And we feel like that's a very unsatisfying experience. So that's partly why we want to kind of divorce that from the idea of, uh, we want to divorce that from, from a potential thing that you can go for um, in our 3v3 mode. So um, one thing in our 3v3 mode that's going to happen is you will never be able to to be eliminated as an individual player, but you'll be able to lose as a team, for instance. I, I really like that. Um, like the, the, when you were talking about, I think there's been some games that I think uh, they made that kind of the the anchor point, like Company of Heroes and Dawn of War came to mind, right? Where you had the victory point system, the base was hard to defend, uh, to dive because it had good defenses. Um, so, so I'm glad to hear that there's a lot of different thoughts going into the, the 3v3 format. Um, Drawing it back to the 1v1s a little bit, I think there's a big question that everyone has in mind, especially for you, given your title, and that's the the esports plan. As I understand it, I think you guys are planning to take more of a community-driven approach, right? Let it grow, see what it becomes. Um, but is there any intent to be kind of maybe slightly more deeply involved in that process? I don't want to say like we're talking full uh, wild wild west of what, for example, Valve does with their system. But maybe, for example, uh, responsible for kind of organizing tournaments that happen through the year to make sure they don't overlap. Maybe providing some sort of structure that leads into, you know, World Cup type events. Is there anything like that uh, in the works from Frostrant? I'm probably not the exact person uh, to talk to about uh, esports plans overall, but I know our general philosophy at the company is number one, like you said, to take that grassroots approach, and number two, to be able to provide to tournament organizers um, the tools that they uh, need in order to host those tournaments and to have a very open uh, open communication with those tournament developers. Um, for example, uh, we're very thankful that uh, in this early stage, uh, we already have a 10K tournament hosted by EGC. Um, it's going to be awesome. There's going to be casters from um, all different games, all different RTS games in the past. Um, and us as developers, we're just um, we're equally excited as the players, if not more, to have our game be played on like such a big stage at this early game, uh, at this early stage, I would say. Um, and I think this is the kind of the the cooperation we're looking towards in the future with tournament organizers. We're definitely not going to try to run some kind of um, you know a Stormgate league. Uh, you know, similar to what other companies might do, might have done in the past. Um, and we're just really going to try to see how we can get uh, Stormgate Esports to be uh, not only organic, but also sustainable at the same time. And, uh, you know, uh, we did see Heoke say that there was going to be like a, a, an end of year zero world championship sometime in 2025. Uh, he mentioned that at the DreamHack thing. But yeah, you know, uh, Killer Pigeon, you or I wouldn't know anything about the, the $10,000 EGC Open Tournament that's happening on the next two weekends and Thursday and Friday. Uh, we're, uh, what is it? What, what, what's an egg C? I've never heard of those. What, yeah, what they do? I don't know. But, you know, we wouldn't know anything about the $10,000 <laughs> EGC Tournament happening Saturday, February 10th, Sunday, February 11th, and then, of course, Thursday through Sunday, 15th through 18th at, uh, at decent times for viewers all across the world. We wouldn't know anything about that. No, but that no. sounds like someone that, yeah. that we should tune into, right, Kevin? I that sounds like someone pretty interesting, right? Yeah. 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 I you know I have some uh, I have some Chinese New Year plans, but and I'm going to be cooking <laughs> for Chinese New Year. But while I'm cooking, I'm going to be, be having EGC uh, on the big stage on my uh, t television right there and then. So I'm definitely going to be tuned in. 
Yeah, as we uh, because as we segue into more design questions eventually, do you have any for those for those players that may be competing in this? There's a 512 player open bracket. Do you have any? Are there any secret <laughs> things that people haven't figured out about yet? Uh, yeah, out yet about how the game works that you should that people should be learning any kind of secrets of the of the not the editor secrets of the um of the engine that secrets secrets of the useful. Kevin I think is what you're after there secrets really of what secrets of the Kevin. <laughs> ah, yes, exactly. So, I, I don't want to divulge any secrets here, necessarily, but oh. what I do know is that from talking to the top players is that there are secrets people mm. haven't figured out yet, and I think we're going to see some of them in the tournament. Yes. There's things are going to be revealed. I know of at least one. Oh. I know of at least one thing that I am also... I've been honor-bound to not reveal, but I will talk about it on broadcast when we see it. Uh, if I'm on the broadcast, of course. Who knows? Um, Who knows? This is their first time hearing this tournament, so how could you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I hope I get to work, mm. and that's the, that's why I put this. That's why this this broadcast is together to let them know that I can talk on the internet. Good. Um, you should pitch that secret to them without telling them the secret, yeah, and it's like go. a big reveal moment, right? They're like, "That's content," and they'll hey, hire you. That's how it hey, works. Hey, Mixu, I got a new thing for you to do. I'm not gonna tell you what it is, but you should do it. <laughs> Dude, all I can think with secret strategies, like. Um, you know the classic thing that happens when someone says there's a secret strat. Mm -hmm. Everyone holds on to it. It's a secret. No one, no one knows what you're thinking. And you get into the tournament, and they all have the same secret <laughs> strat, <now>, right? <laughs> what I, what I will say honestly, is, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but it, it is going to make it hard forever ends up covering this because, like, you do all the prep you want, and then all this stuff has been hidden in customs, and you're like, well, I, I all my prep doesn't matter anymore because, again, that's what's happening. Um, Going back to talk about design briefly, and I know we've we've held you, we've had you for a while, Monk. Uh, I also need to eat dinner, so that's going to have to happen soon before we, we start doing some things in the evening. But I was wondering if you have any thoughts about kind of competitive map design because we we're the 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 footage we see on screen right now is Secluded Grove. We had Jagged Ma earlier. There's Broken Crown. There are there are four maps in like competitive that are competitively viable in Stormgate right now, and another one in development uh, with 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 um, with Boneyard. And they all seem to interrogate very different ideas. You know, Broken Crown could be more of a classic RTS map. Secluded Grove has this thing in the center that's really important and weird things. Uh, Jack and Ma has siege camps you can push with. Uh, Twisted Crown is, um, or Titan's Causeway is, you know, you would take your naturals really, really hard. Um, can you give any insight into your the, the team's map design progress as you figure out what is actually going to be a good map, I guess, in, in Stormgate? Yeah, the, the way we've approached map design um, in Stormgate so far is we we are still a small team. We have a limited number, uh, we have the limited capability to make maps. So what we're trying to do with maps right now is trying to make as many different types of maps as possible. And we're in the stage where we're basically trying to figure out what makes a good Stormgate map. Um, we can't just copy and paste a map from other RTSs. Um, we, so we just have to try out these really crazy things. I think in the future, um, our maps are going to be maybe a little more standardized than what they are now, maybe a little less standardized than a StarCraft II. Um, but yeah, we're just trying to take the approach of learning lessons. And I think we've learned a lot of lessons. Uh, number one, how big a map should be. I think generally all our maps are a little on the small side um, and they are a little on the narrow side. So in the future, I think we're going to be looking to make more, more wide open maps. Another lesson that we've learned is that in Stormgate in particular, um, one thing is creep density shapes the uh, shapes the map balance a lot and how a map plays a lot. The number of creeps per square inch, I would say, or per square uh, per like map grid. Um, and I think the best examples are I think Broken Crown has a lot of creeps uh, on the map per screen. And that leads to a lot of uh, gaunts being really good. Um, a lot of, for example, um, scouts or fiends that can run across the map, uh, around the map being really good so that they can take camps one by one. Um, on the other side of things, we have a map like the one we're seeing right now. Secluded Grove has very few creeps, especially few creeps that are very contestable. So what players do is just get 
one creep, number two creep, and then they're kind of done and they're very turtly. They're not encouraged to go out uh, on the map as much on this particular map. And it kind of plays like a very standard RTS where you're kind of just attacking each other and creeps aren't really a thing. Um, so that's a big lesson that we've learned um, just from our first four maps alone. And uh, we hope to iterate on that. But then again, uh, we're going to rework creep camps entirely or pretty significantly. So who knows what maps will look like after uh, we take that pass. One thing that, that kind of comes to mind on the level design choices, right, is like the third unspoken off faction that we don't know anything about yet. Um, I'm curious from a design perspective there, is that obviously, you know, you have to nail down the details, but is there broad strokes in mind that you're already thinking about when it comes to how you handle existing maps, right? Like, for example, with the creep that we have for the Infernals, right? When you were brewing up these maps before you fully fleshed that out, were you already thinking about how this was going to impact the maps you were creating? I think one, th so maybe not necessarily for the third faction, but we know that we want to um, interact with creeps in, in interesting ways, other than just killing them and picking up the resources. And, and what I can reveal is that um, the third faction might have a special way of, of interacting with creeps that we haven't seen yet. Ooh, the beast master Ooh. race. You, you, instead of yes. killing the creeps, you make them your friends. That what if that's the, the hint? What if that's yeah. the hint, right? We have the uh, <gasps> we have the the new um, the Steam Next Fast trailer, oh. and you have three co-op com commanders. They go up and they high five and they say, "We're friends." <laughs> yeah. there, we got it. What 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 if the entire third faction is just like a beast master, and it goes around befriend? Its its ability is called befriend. And it and you at the end of the game you get an army of chickens and goats and deer. I mean, uh, uh. I, I would just recommend getting a kid who wears a baseball cap that's red and giving him uh. an ability to capture. But you might have lawsuits with that. But you know, I, these I masters probably comes us better. I, I know. <laughs> I that, give that's what sells games okay. these days. <laughs> Are we just secretly watching a different game's uh, development cycle to see if they get sued? <laughs> well, no, Fort Faction just happens to be one kid who uh, just recruits enemy armies to his side. Oh, dear. Yeah, man. Hmm. The, the overlaps between certain pet capturing games and, and Frost Giant <laughs> are actually significant. <laughs> With, you know, Torch, former Frost Giant employee being, you know... Well, I guess his wife being very much a Pokemon fan. But anyways, um, hmm. looking on, because I do want to let you go, because we've been doing this for about half an hour or so, and think you know i could take up all your time but and i do take up all your time sometimes finding voice <laughs> chats where you're in and asking questions it works out great um let's see you let's give i want to give a bit more opportunity for people in chat to ask uh, we did have someone actually on the steam chat uh paying attention and i, I hopefully answered their question but um they said they were they're not really focused on the esports side of things uh but will there be a frost giant push on helping be the stormgate be that next esports rts so maybe not funding ways but other ways to get you into uh, an esport for example um in client abilities to view the tournaments rapid or like different things like that that might give you that might give someone access to an esport that they might not otherwise have yeah i do. so so again i'm not the best person to talk to about some of these things and the things that i do know about this are because not because i'm in meetings about them because but because more i happen to overhear them when someone around the office is walking around. But I know, um, number one, that Stormgate is engineered in a way such that it is um, relatively, relatively simple for uh, in-game, uh, uh, the ability to watch games within the client itself uh, relative to some other games in the past. And number two, uh, there are plans for um, a... Uh, we we do have some ideas in the works for um like a a newbie to to like competitor um uh what's the word i'm looking for oh path to pro type thing path to pro kind yeah. of thing yes exactly interesting hmm. oh that, that's exciting that's that's good to hear i think like the other thing you know um the, the fact that you guys are quite open on that, like I'm excited to see if there's ways for like uh, TOs to integrate with like things like uh, cosmetics comes to mind, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Especially with a game kind of model like this. So definitely a lot of exciting things. Um, I imagine we have to be cognitive of time, Beomoth, but what I do love is that we have got deep enough in the series that we haven't done Kevin Dirty with there the Yeti Cup there. He's coming which back. Which is what uh, <laughs> I wanted to just highlight that right now. 2-1. <laughs> 
Ah. Yeah, the VOD's an Bonks hour. On the board. We're not planning on having this thing be an hour. Uh, I do have an, uh, another question from chat uh, that we do have. Where is that? want to make sure that I have the name properly. As uh, a French boy would like to know what the role uh, the Hornet is supposed to have. Go into that I think a little the, bit. Yeah. yeah, the Hornet is still... I think it's... I think, I think like about half our units are fairly solidified and half of them are, I would say, less solidified. I think Hornet, the Hornet belongs into the later half. Um, right now, its intended role is to be um, an anti-air role, especially against light units, um, with a minor poking role um, against ground units. And I think it's... It's good in a 1v1 fight against other air units right now, but I think the problem right now is um, I think the Shadow Flyers probably do too much AoE damage, so um, maybe that's something that I'll change. Who knows? Certainly not me. Well, I will say is that the problem that I see with Hornets is not the, the anti-air stuff. It's that it's oppressive against ground units with how early it can come out, so... Please, please don't remove my ability to, to at least wipe them from the map if they make a mistake. <laughs> it's my thought. It's my worry. Please, monk. <laughs> it's the only way I can deal with it. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, unless there are any other questions, uh, y'all, if you're in chat, either on Steam or on Twitch, you got about 30 seconds to ask any more questions you may have. Uh, otherwise, we're gonna let Monk go to do whatever else he's got to do today and have fun with that. So while we wait to see, um, oh, okay, we can ask this one, I think, and then we're gonna we're gonna ask one last question and then we're gonna go and let you go along. Um, is pathing unit collision something that's being iterated on? Uh, and asking another way, is Snowplay considered a done thing, or is it still being worked out? So I will quote the the words of the famous James Anhalt, who currently works on our pathing and our engine, and also worked on the StarCraft II pathing and engine. Um, pathing is something that will be worked on almost at in if it in infinitum infinitum infinit infinitum yeah. um not necessarily that but it'll be worked on for a very long time it's a very iterative process um and it'll like especially we've gotten a lot of feedback over the past few play tests and we've iterated on the engine based on that very direct feedback and i think the best way to give feedback um is specifically if you think um the pathing isn't working as expected or you think it could be better to take a video of the pathing not working as expected describe what you think it could be doing better and then post it in um, our discord um, that is the easiest way to get our attention um and we've probably made like 10, 20 changes based on that process alone okay. that yeah. Beowulf can attest to. Yeah. Like really good example. I Scarlet Monk and I, and I think one of uh, Mana maybe just kind of got ourselves in a, in a, in a thread and tried to solve because dog scouts had some, some significant pathing issues in, in the pre alpha and we just got it solved in the next test. It was totally fine. So they are actively making significant changes patch over patch can confirm. I mean, I've got the perfect question to round this out. Okay. Someone just asked, like, how much can uh, Monk bench? I think the simplest way to show that is uh, the the four hammer. Clearly. Excuse uh, me. I don't know if I'm. I don't know if I'm worthy. But are you not worthy? Are you not worthy? Are you worthy to balance this game, uh, Monk? Uh, He's worthy to balance <laughs> this game. There we go. There we go. <sighs> All right, Monk, the man worthy of balancing things. He can lift the hammer of Thor. Any final thoughts before we let you go this evening? Um, yeah, just thank you for for having me. I'm I'm just really overwhelmed by the amount of excitement that I've been seeing, um, not only through the Discord but uh, through all the streaming channels that I've seen this morning. Um, it feels really great to uh, kind of finally show off uh, the game that everyone can publicly play now, um, and it's it's just uh, super humbling and rewarding to um, to have people spend their precious time playing this this crazy RTS game that we've been developing for two, three years, and to see it even in competitive tournaments, uh, I believe this weekend, that who knows who will be casting, but I'm certainly gonna be looking forward to that. 